Okay, so the next section is something we're not used to in, in the salon. It's known as cross-examination. We're used to it in a legal context, we're not in these discussions. Uh, my only real question is how you'd like to do it. Would you like to sit and shout your question out and project your voice like a yeah. member of Learned Council, or would you go to the microphone? It's your oh, choice. I think we'll sit down. Great. Because All right. we are Learned Council. Oh, certainly, yes, <laughs> my learned friends. Uh, uh, Peter, go ahead. Okay, so my first question uh, to Anne uh, would be, how do you discern personhood and moral status for any given human being? What, what, is the, what are the grounds by which you say this or that has moral status? Is, is it simply self-consciousness, or is there something more to it than that? Firstly, I think that I think it's a mistake to assume that to address the question in the way that I've addressed it, one needs to look at specific individual cases. I don't think that it's a question of basically saying, does that person have capacity, or does that person have capacity, or does that person have capacity? I think it's perfectly appropriate to be able to say that before a creature before a human creature has reached this particular stage of its development, it simply does not have the ability to have those attributes that we think are uh, demonstrably important in defining personhood. And as I indicated, there are lots of different elements that we can pull out, whether it's self-consciousness, a sense of biography, a sense of agency, a sense of awareness. You can pull in sentience and a whole number of other things. And we can track back and say that those things kick in at a particular point. But there is a, a certain point at which I think that we can safely say before that point, the entity does not have that accumulation of qualities. So therefore, although it has the potential, you cannot really describe it as being fully what we think about when we think about as being a person. So which, potential, which particular capacities would you refer to as being determinant of personhood and why? I think for me, the crucial element is a sense of self-awareness. And it's a sense of one, it's a sense of self-awareness. It's a sense of being alive. Now that is not to say that it's open season on anything that doesn't have a sense of self-awareness and being alive. I mean, my cat, I do not regard as being a person. Um, at the same time, I am incorrigibly fond of my cat and probably, you know, would, would and probably have greater affection and respect for my cat than I do for some human beings. But it doesn't so it but so it doesn't mean that because we do not accord those particular qualities, it's open season. But it does mean that that that, that we can that we can begin to think about what the difference is between what you like to call the pre-born and what I would call the post-born in and of themselves, without necessarily referring to the question of the geography, whether it's simply inside or outside the, the womb. Well, you didn't give me a why there. Why self-awareness? What makes self-awareness so special? I think that self-awareness is particularly special because I think that it speaks to that point of the specific knowing that we have as people that animals do not. And I think it's part of what can make us rational. It's part of what makes us different. And so in the same way that I don't have um, a problem with according animals a particular moral status, but I see them as being entirely subservient to those of us that have that full moral status that we accord to, to, to people. So I would look at, um, at embryos and fetuses in the same, in the same way. But why, are we, uh, why differentiate from other animals? Um, why not go Peter Singer's route and actually regard um, certain animals as actually more important than certain human beings? And, and why also, why is it rationality? What, you said it was a part of what makes us <coughs> rational. Why should rationality or a part of what makes us rational? I'm trying to hit the, the, the basic 
premise and fundamental ground of your argument here, because these are, these are interesting uh, reasons that of themselves, but what's the basic core reason why you think a part, of what, a part of what makes us rational is particularly important, and why should we indeed differentiate ourselves from animals in any case? Is it just gratuitous speciesism, um, or is, it, is there some actual rational basis for the speciesism, as it were? I think there is a basis for the speciesism, actually, because I think that the problem is, is that once we lose, um, once we lose a sense of, of our real sense of humanity being linked to our ability to do that peculiarly special thing, which is to exercise agency, once we lose that from the equation, then I think we end up entirely degrading what humanity is and losing it to almost a kind of biological livingism, which reduces what's special about humans to um, just the rest of the animal kingdom. And I think that there is something that is incredibly special about people. I think there's something about our ability to, um, to develop the planet that we're on, to care about the actions that we take, to build a particular kind of society. And so I bulk very much when people want to say that all we are is DNA and a beating heart and our physical body parts, because I believe that there is something in humans that is more than that. And so it distresses me greatly when your side of the argument wants to reduce the specialness of humanity to, um, to basically a beating heart and DNA, because I think that we are so much more than that. And in some ways, I think that it's a shame that you guys departed from at least a notion of ensoulment and man being made in God's own image, because at least that had a sense of the specialness of what we are, which I think you seem to have completely abandoned. Quite the contrary. I think that's a character, but um, I will deal with that in a rebuttal. Uh, <laughs> What I will go on to is the other part of the problem with that. You said that we needn't, um, we needn't therefore um, abandon a concern for, if we're going to say that um, uh, rationality or self-awareness, um, we needn't therefore, by extending the logic, um, abandon the personhood and moral status of those who lack those qualities. Uh, why the hell not? Well, because I think that we can extend compassion <laughs> but why should and, we extend compassion? Well, because What's your rational basis for that? Because we are compassionate creatures in our humanity. And one of the wonderful qualities that we have of human beings is our ability to care for others and to accord a sense of acting as moral agents. So would you say it would be right? The other, which, is, which is the other side of the argument here. So presumably by extension it would be right to show compassion for the unborn child. I think that generally it is right to show compassion for the unborn for the unborn child. It's right to show. Generally, I think generally it well, is why absolutely. Not always? Because if compassion is an important principle. No, why because always? I think it, I think it really comes from where you stand. I'm really interested. The person who really spoke to me on this question actually was um, Ronald Dworkin who um, I, I was reading recently um, one of his, his later books just before he died, and he talks about the sense of cosmic awe that we can experience when we look at um, great moments in nature. And you know, that sense of, of a religious, secular sense of wonder and I have to say that I have a huge presumption in favour of life. You know, you look at the, the notion of what an embryo is. I can see you smiling here because you think I'm on the way to your side of the argument here and you are so wrong, That's Peter. not why I'm smiling. Though, <laughs> you know, that, that real sort of sense that you look at the embryo and you think with a real sense of cosmic awe, all of evolution has led to that, you know? 
And I think that people feel in that way generally about it. But then the important thing about it is that then when you look at how those issues have to be resolved in life, life is so much more complicated than philosophy. And the problem is, is that when philosophy accords moral status or our obligation to moral status in the way that you do, then you have to take away some of the moral status from the woman in pregnancy.